Why should I die for a country that thought so little of me and my people? Why would a black man risk his life to help his country? The answer was simple. This is my country. This is my duty. Regardless of the social climate, regardless of the faults, this is my country. The story of the 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion, also known as the Triple Nichols, is one of the tragedies of a segregated army preventing them from serving their country on the battlefield, yet also one of triumph in perseverance and determination to prove themselves as capable as any other man and eventually helping lead to the desegregation of the United States Army. During the 19th and 20th centuries until a few years after World War II, the military was segregated. Segregation was the result of the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court case in 1896, which separated white people from black people while justifying it as a separate but equal principle. This segregated every area of the public, workplace, and military in favor of non-African Americans. But with America entering World War II after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the need for more soldiers became priority over who could and couldn't serve in the military based on their race. Despite this change, African American men who joined the military were often given the menial jobs of being cooks and truck drivers, among other lesser tasks. The army was so segregated that even the prisoners of war were given seats with the white American soldiers in the mess halls, but colored soldiers weren't. Before the men became the 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion, they were stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia in 1943 as a service company. Their job was to guard the parachute school equipment and properties used by the teams throughout the day. One man and acting first sergeant, Walter Morris, began to notice that his men had low morale as they were treated like servants instead of soldiers. To address this, he came up with a secret plan to have his men watch the training procedures performed by previous groups. Then, when they took over their guard duty at 4 o'clock next to the calisthenic field, they would repeat what they had seen that day on the equipment and train themselves. The others agreed to his idea and so they put the plan into action. They trained themselves for about a month doing push-ups, using the jump platforms, and practicing with the C-47 plane model among other training exercises. Within just days, Morse could already see the difference in what the secret training had done for his men. An amazing thing happened because after a week or two of that type of uh, regiment, we, I could notice a, a distinct improvement in their appearance, mm -hmm. the servicemen, my men appearance, uh, their, their clothes were pressed, they, 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 when you talk to them, they looked you straight in the eye and they began to act like soldiers rather than servants. Mm -hmm. Then, one day, completely unnoticed by Morris and the others, Commanding General Wrigley Gaither of the Parachute School passed by the calisthenic field and saw the 50 men actively training on the paratrooper equipment. Morris was called to General Gaither's office the next morning, and when asked why, he gave an explanation for their training on the equipment instead of guarding it. Impressed, General Gaither asked Morris to be the permanent first sergeant of a soon-to-be 555th parachute company. Walter accepted, and on December 30th of 1943, the first colored 555th parachute company was activated. The Army selected 19 other men and Morris to start a four-week program to train paratroopers in January of 1944. It was after this time when the 17 of the 20 men graduated from training that the Army opened up the opportunity for any colored men to apply for the parachute company. The volunteers came in by the hundreds. The group became so big that the Army had to deactivate the 555th Parachute Company and then activate them as the first 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion on November 25, 1944. Now that the group was a battalion, they could not only have their own officers but headquarters too and were moved to Camp McCall, North Carolina in late 1944. The men continued training as paratroopers while some were moved to combat training. The Triple Nickels were going to fight in the war in Europe. 
However, shortly after the call to be sent to Europe was announced, it was cancelled just as quickly and for two main reasons. One was the European war was coming to an end, but the second was more of a tragedy from what they heard. Thanks, but no thanks. We don't want any black paratroopers. Now the Army's got 450 young black men, paratroopers, tough, uh, uh, disciplined, and no place to put them. Though the Triple Nickels were unwanted because they were black, this excuse neglected the fact that there was already an all-colored pilots unit fighting in Europe called the Tuskegee Airmen. But with the change of mission plans in 1945 came the Triple Nickels assignment for Operation Firefly for the war with Japan in the Pacific. It was around this time that the Battle of Luzon was taking place between the two countries. The Japanese had engineered giant incendiary balloon bombs to start forest fires that were carried by the jet stream across the Pacific to the North American continent. These balloons were 33 feet in diameter and could carry about 1,000 pounds. Only about 285 of the six to 9,000 balloons released were recovered and their locations ranging from Alaska through Canada to Mexico and as far inland as Michigan and Texas. Operation Firefly was a secret mission to fight the fires caused by the bombs and safely detonate any that had not done so already. The Triple Nickels were to be retrained as the first military smoke jumpers and carry out this mission on home ground. The mission was secret due to the government not wanting the American public or the Japanese to know how effective the balloons really were. In May of 1945, the Triple Nickels were separated into two groups and stationed in Chico, California and Pendleton, Oregon. Unfortunately, though their mission was new, the way the locals treated them wasn't. They were insulted, cut in front of in lines at stores, even in uniform, and only two restaurants served them, all because they were colored men. Though the Triple Nickels had training, there were still several injuries, most commonly ankle injuries, but also backs and chest injuries. The only fatality to occur in either of the groups was a headquarters medic, Melvin Brown, who lost his grip during a descent from a tree and fell 150 feet, killing him almost instantly. Despite the danger of the mission, the Triple Nickels fought 36 fires and made over 1,200 jumps within about six months from May to October of 1945. Though the group didn't fight on the front lines of the war, they battled a threat that could have been just as dangerous if it had been left unmanaged. They were sent back to North Carolina and were stationed at Fort Bragg where they carried out their duties. Then, on December 15, 1947, the 555th were deactivated and, by request of Commanding General James Gavin, they were integrated into the 82nd Airborne Division as the 3rd Battalion, 505th Airborne Infantry. The Triple Nickels were the first colored group to be integrated at the same level as white soldiers in the Army, nearly seven months before President Harry Truman signed the Executive Order 9981 that integrated and desegregated the entire army. This integration was quite possibly the greatest triumph the Triple Nickels accomplished among the many things they did. The Triple Nickels' success in fighting the Japanese bombs and fires led to a great triumph in a short-lived battle. Their response to 36 fires and completing over 1,200 jumps helped win the war when the Japanese attempted to bring it to American soil. In the end, their perseverance and effort helped lead to one of the first accounts of desegregation in the Army as they became part of the 82nd Airborne Division and, among other groups, helped lead to the desegregation of the whole Army. The Triple Nickel proved to themselves and to the Army that black soldiers the same as white soldiers, no better but no worse. And so it was a, uh, an awakening for them and for us that we could live together, soldier together, and that was a, a big, big but their story didn't end there. After World War II, the original members of the 555th continued to serve in the most airborne units during times of peace and war than any other group of men and throughout the years were recognized for their services at several events. They, among other groups and individuals, proved that separate but equal is not equality, but that together and equal is.